Less than two weeks after the 44th federal election, it's time to start lining up the priorities and looking ahead to the next session of Parliament. What's on the horizon for us? Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location and practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. The snap election called by the Liberals failed to give them a majority, which means they will have to work with others to accomplish anything. Our unpublished.vote question asks you, what should be the top priority of the new federal government? Economic recovery, climate change, indigenous reconciliation, or electoral reform? You can log on now and at unpublished.vote and have your voice heard. There's no time to bask in the glow of an electoral win for the Liberals as not much changed in terms of the House of Commons. The Grits were able to last a year and a half in the House with the support of the NDP. It may be a partnership that makes sense for them again. Coming up on the Unpublished Cafe, we'll talk about what the priorities should be for the government to get the economy back on track. Later in the show, we'll chat with chat with Aaron Woodrick of the McDonald Laurier Institute, as well Charles Bird from the Ernst Cliff Strategy Group will join us. But first, I'm pleased to be joined by Katrina Miller, Program Director at the Broadbent Institute. And, and Katrina, how would you characterize this past election campaign for the NDP? Well, I think the NDP, you know, walks out of this election campaign with uh, the party beyond the uh, People's Party of Canada with the largest increase in its vote share, um, which shows that its ideas do have good resonance amongst Canadians. I think everyone's walking away from this election, frankly, a little confused and disappointed about why we had the election and what, what's actually come of it. Um, ultimately, though, I think, it, you know, it really shows that Canadians thought that the minority government that was in place before uh, was largely working in some sort of way because they wouldn't have brought the same back and that's what they did. What do you see that should be the top priority of the government going ahead? Well, I think Canadians are ready to see a post-pandemic Canada that is frankly a better version of Canada than the one that we walked into the pandemic with. That's what we've seen time and time again. We've looked at uh, polling and commentary that Canadians are really looking for us to uh, kind of start off again in a way that builds a fairer, more just, more sustainable Canada. And so I think that there's some things that the government needs to do right off the bat in order to show, really prove people, give people proof points around this instead of just sort of tokenism uh, and, and symbolic language, um, particularly around healthcare and around climate change. And, and they can do so in both those ways in investing in healthcare and climate change in ways that help us restart our economy, but restart our, uh, the kind of economy that Canadians want. You know, in terms of healthcare for, for spurring on the economy, is that one sector enough to get it going? Well, no, I don't think any one sector is enough to get it going. Frankly, I think that these are places that need major investment, um, both to spur on the economy and to ensure that we are walking out of the pandemic into a better Canada. Right now, our healthcare system, you know, has been absolutely burdened beyond its beyond its capacity over the last two years. We're seeing healthcare professionals leave the system in droves because of burnout because of you know just having that sense of needing to change um, and so we need to do everything we can in order to reinvest into our healthcare system in order to ensure that it's still a good healthcare system but we've also heard from canadians um, that they want to see a better healthcare system than we came into the pandemic with they want to see a healthcare system that helps cover their drug costs um, pharmacare you know dropped off the liberals platform but stayed on canadians minds um, that's an investment that we can make into our healthcare system. The provinces are calling for much greater investment in the healthcare system in order to reduce wait times, in order to ensure that those sorts of services Canadians are needing, especially as Canadians get older, are there for them. Um, and I think the federal government has to step up. They can step up in a way that actually helps benefit our economy by making it an investment in what people are now terming the care economy. Um, and the care economy is, you know, healthcare, education, um, community services sort of make up the big fraction of the care economy. Just to give you a sense, the care economy already occupies about 25% of our economic, um, our economic production in Canada. So um, there's a lot of people calling, and I agree with them, uh, for us to ramp up that investment in the care economy and healthcare sits right in the center of that. You know, tax the rich was a refrain we heard a lot during the campaign. Can it move forward and, and would it make much of a financial difference? 
Well, I think that, you know, there's no one tax proposal that is going to shift our finances completely. Um, so, you know, the wealth tax will make a significant difference. You could fund farm care basically by the wealth tax in and of itself. Um, but I think that the, the conversation around taxes has shifted from a space that's been in for 30 years where it's been about lowering taxes to a new space where it's about fair tax about ensuring that those with greater wealth pay their fair share. And every single party came to the table this election with some conversation about fair taxation and making sure that those with greater wealth pay their fair share. Some came with more robust proposals like the NDP uh, came forward with you know, wealth tax, pandemic profit tax, closing tax loopholes. The Bloc came forward with a wealth tax. Even the Liberals came forward with some tax measures, including a, you know, a minimum tax on those high income earners of 15%. I think they can do more. And I think by doing more, they will start to gain the long term resources we need, revenue we need in this country to really expand those systems people depend on, like health care, like income support programs, and also expand those investments into the green economy. You know, Justin Trudeau amused late in the campaign about electoral reform, primarily ranked ballots versus proportional representation. Now, we heard that in 2015. Nothing happened. Do you expect any movement on this? Uh, you know, sadly, I wish I could say different. I don't think we'll see any movement on this from the government. Uh, we've kind of gone through this uh, this conversation with them already once, and it doesn't seem that Justin Trudeau has has shifted at all. You know, there were consultations and expert reports uh, that came out of that 2015 commitment, um, and all of them landed on a proportional representation system. The public's calling for it. The experts were calling for it. Uh, Justin Trudeau knew at that time that that was the system that people were saying was going to be more fair and more inclusive and lead to better democratic outcomes. And he stuck with rank ballot. Um, and, and that's ultimately what broke the promise. You know, when he opened this two days, I think, before E-Day, he, he was very clear that he was not interested in considering anything but rank ballot. So I think that's a non-starter, that conversation, for a lot of people who recognize that that's not the right system, that's not the system that's going to deliver what we want in electoral reform. Katrina, I want to thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Ed. Thank you so much for having me. Katrina Miller is Program Director at the Broadband Institute. The road ahead will be daunting for the government as it has so many priorities to accomplish, all in the backdrop of the fourth wave of the pandemic. Charles Bird is managing principal at Ernst Cliff Strategy and he joins us now. And, and Charles, there's no time to waste for the, for the new government. You say it must hit the ground running. When it comes to picking cabinet, what considerations are there? Wow, um, quite a few. I mean, we know that Christopher Freeland will remain as deputy prime minister and finance minister. And that largely cements her status as front runner to succeed the prime minister as leader, whenever that might happen. Um, we also know that four female ministers from his previous cabinet aren't around anymore, uh, suggesting that we'll see some new faces at the cabinet table, uh, noting as well the prime minister's ongoing commitment to a gender balanced cabinet. Um, now, the folks that the prime minister might draw on can be from the class of 2015, the class of 2019, and potentially even ca candidates elected on September 20th. And we saw this happen in 2019 with the appointment of uh, Anita Anon and Stephen Guibault, who had only then just been elected for the first time. But of course, when, when you're appointing new people and moving ministers, it can create something of a cascading effect, given the sheer number of considerations that go into cabinet making, like gender, diversity, regional representation. You know, one indication is that it's difficult to think that the prime minister wouldn't appoint one of his two newly elected Alberta MPs to the cabinet. There's also other important considerations, skill sets, previous experience, and what you might term political sure-footedness, which is the ability not to create problems of your own making as a minister. So essentially, you want ministers with safe hands who can handle themselves in their portfolios. Well, the throne speech will be something that will follow next, uh, obviously, after get, getting the cabinet ready. And, and what are you looking for uh, in, in this speech to see where the country is going? Well, you know, largely, it's a reiteration of what we saw 
from the previous government in terms of its initiatives. Um, it's also uh, going to be a reflection of what was in the Liberal platform in the most recent campaign. Um, but what I'll be looking for personally is any hint as to what the Prime Minister has decided with regards to his own future. Um, and that basically boils down to whether it's his intention to contest another election or whether he regards his current mandate as his last one. And uh, it, it, he's not likely to say either way, but a good number of his MPs and candidates got an earful at the door in the recent campaign mm -hmm. as to what some have referred to as Trudeau fatigue. So if he's inclined to run again, then he'll likely govern accordingly with an eye to winning the next election and improving his electoral position. But if he's determined that this will be his last mandate and that he won't run again, then he's more likely to focus on key legacy issues such as Indigenous affairs and combating climate change and, and also childcare. So if, if it's the latter case that he's not running again, this may mean more leeway being given to his ministers to attend to those issues which don't fall within the legacy category. If it's the former um, and he does want to run again, we can expect most, if not all, government business to be overseen by the PMO, which has largely been the case over the last six years. We'll be looking ahead to a fall economic statement and then the budget. And I'm wondering, you know, we won't know those numbers uh, before the throne speech, but I, I would imagine they would have, you, you would think they'd have an impact on that throne speech. Where you're oh, yeah. Spend. yeah. I mean, you know, um, it's funny because I think the Conservatives would much rather have fought the last election on who was better to lead Canada in terms of economic recovery coming out of the election and dealing with the, the, the huge fiscal challenge that exists. Um, but we have to remember that, you know, we're not out of COVID yet. And, you know, there's no better example of that than what's happening in Saskatchewan, Alberta at the moment. Um, and but there, there's no doubt that the fiscal challenge that COVID has left in its wake will emerge over the coming months as a key issue, even if it's not addressed chapter and verse in the speech from the throne. Um, other big time issues we're likely to see health care and the question of additional transfers to the provinces. Uh, the, federal, the federal government's already signaled, and the Prime Minister himself has signaled, that said transfers won't come without preconditions. So this is likely to set the stage for uh, a fair bit of federal and provincial wrangling. You can also throw in the issue of long-term care in there, which is made all the more notable by the demographic realities of an aging population that predate the pandemic. Now, the long-term care is more provincial in jurisdiction, but it's also an area where federal officials obviously have interests and have had some things to say. And then the, the other biggie is, is climate change, um, which is set against the backdrop of the scheduled international meeting uh, scheduled for November 1st to 12th, uh, so-called COP26 in Glasgow. And, you know, in terms of uh, domestic policy vis-a-vis -vis climate change, we are going to see an increase in carbon pricing um, those, you know, carbon pricing is going to be ratcheted up, ratcheted up over the coming months. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how the government not only addresses those issues in the throne speech, but also um, tackles them going forward because they're so intrinsically tied to economic recovery. Uh, the Liberals with the minority parliament, and that means you're going to have to work with others. Do you expect the NDP to prop them up or, or possibly would the bloc step in? You know, in the previous parliament, it was both. I mean, there were times when the NDP stepped up and there were times when the bloc stepped up. Uh, only the Liberals really wanted an election uh, over recent months. And um, there's no reason to think that any party is going to tempt the wrath of the Canadian people uh, by forcing an election uh, too quickly. So, you know, it, it, there's some outside chance that the Liberals might enter into a formal or informal agreement with the NDP, which would certainly lead to more progressive posturing in terms of its policy making and policy development. That said, I expect it'll be a lot like 2019 to 2021, the previous parliament, where it's very much an ad hoc transitional uh, transactional arrangement. And um, but, you know, this feels a little more like a traditional minority, notwithstanding the same numbers, which is to say the campaign was so cantankerous and divisive that I think the Liberals could have a, a tougher time getting stuff through on the legislative side. Um, and so that really goes to 
who are your house leaders, right? Do you have a bunch of individuals who can work together effectively across the floor to get things done? Or is it just a, a, a partisan gong show? You know, a lot of bills, some controversial, died when the election was called. Do you expect them to be reintroduced? Yeah, I don't. I don't see why not. Um, I mean, this is uh, this is a government that's very intent on what it wants to do. Um, you know, there's been some people who've suggested, oh, the platform was all about show and it was all about electoral positioning, and and those commitments won't be taken very seriously. I, I disagree. I think what's in the platform is likely to to be the watchword going forward in terms of what this government intends to do. And I think previous legislation, it falls into a different but not dissimilar category of, you know, what this government is about and what it wants to accomplish. Charles, I want to thank you for joining us. Delighted, Ed. Thanks. Charles Bird is managing principal at Ernst Cliff Strategy. Now, the road to economic recovery in Canada is a tall hill to climb. Aaron Woodricks, the director of domestic policy at the McDonald Laurier Institute, and he joins us now. And Aaron, what do you see as the number one focus of this new federal government? Well, look, I don't think a lot of a lot has changed since before the election. Uh, we have the, basically the same government, and I think the same priorities are going to continue for that government. Um, uh, suffice to say, they're not terribly concerned about things like the deficit. They are concerned about getting Canadians through the pandemic. And they've identified a number of other things like uh, regulating the internet, fighting climate change, which I think are at the top of their list. So it's going to be interesting to see if, uh, if the election changed anything at all, if we're essentially going to see the same sort of approach as we did before. Uh, what, what do you see as the biggest impediments for, for the federal government to tackle its uh, priorities? You know, I think the thing that's sort of missing from the discussion and was frankly missing almost entirely during the election was economic growth. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how to sort of divide up the, the wealth we generate, um, how to help people who need help. But there wasn't a lot of talk about how we're going to generate economic growth over the next sort of 5, 10, 20 years. And that's very important, of course, because you, you can have all the wonderful plans you want to, to, to spend on things. But if you can't figure out how you're going to generate the revenue to pay for it, you, you have a bit of a problem. You know, I, I was reading, you feel stimulus might not be needed anymore. Why is that? Yeah, it's interesting uh, because the government, you know, obviously when the pandemic hit, there was a very uh, sort of broad-based shutdown. The government had to send out emergency support, right? I mean, we were talking about people who had no income coming. People have to buy groceries, pay rent. So the government set up programs like the emergency response benefit, which has since been tailored into a different benefit. A lot of money went out the door at that time. And it's hard to argue that they didn't have to do something. The problem is the way they went about it uh, resulted in a lot of people who didn't actually need the money that much, throwing it in the bank. So there's actually a very large sort of preloaded stimulus. And in fact, Krista Freeland herself used that word sort of preloaded. The Canadians are sitting on record savings right now. Uh, if you were doing okay before the pandemic, um, you may be doing even better now in terms of your savings. So there's a lot of money sitting in the bank. That in a lot of ways could be seen as a stimulus uh, when things open up again. Canadians who've been waiting to do things like travel, for example, might start tapping those funds. So there might not be a need for the government to spend even more in addition to that, because a lot of what they've sent out the door has actually been thrown in the bank. You know, uh, we talk about job creation as well and job creation programs. Conservatives talked about something uh, to bring forward during the campaign. But do we really need something like that as we seem to be recovering in terms of in terms of jobs? Yeah, look, I, I think the only uh, the, the primary constraint on economic growth right now is twofold. One is whether there are, are lockdowns and that there is a severe burden on our healthcare system. Certain provinces, for example, like Alberta and Saskatchewan, are are having a tougher time with COVID right now. That results in in uh, in uh, second order impacts on the economy, and so it's hard it's hard to do business right when when things are shut down. Uh, but if things are open. Um, the only other constraint then is, are there certain supports? And, you know, if you've been driving around town, you've probably seen a lot of help wanted ads in a lot of businesses, especially areas like hospitality uh, that are that are trying to recover. I um, mean, the challenge is uh, it's twofold. On the one hand, government wants to help people who need help. But if you're too generous with your help, um, you're incentivizing some people to not look for work. And that's why you see a lot of businesses uh, struggling right now to find workers. So it's a it's a it's a tough needle of thread because, of course, you want to help people who need it. But if you're if you're too broad, broad with your help, you end up actually sort of removing people from the from the workforce when when a lot of businesses are in desperate need of people. You know, I, I, I've heard that argument several times and, and uh, I, I've seen it several times 
uh, as well. Uh, the thing I see about that is in terms of in terms of CERB, uh, they get five hundred dollars a week, so two thousand dollars a month. If you look at that, that's less than minimum wage in Ontario. So I, I'm kind of wondering, is that not more a reflection on how the employees are being treated by the employer? Yeah, look, it's not a ton of money, but remember, not all the people who are earning CERB are sort of, uh, they're they are not uh, independently living, right? You have people who are sort of living at home with their parents, and $2,000 may not be a lot of money to support a family, for example, but if you're a young person who doesn't have to pay room and board, um, that might be the difference between you saying, you know what, I'm not going to go look for work at 20 or 30 hours a week, you know, a, a, as a server, for example, or a bartender, uh, when you could get the money, uh, you know, without doing anything at all. And in terms of the, the wages that that employers are paying, you know, that's a fair point. If you want to get more people, you pay more. The 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 problem there is, of course, the prices then for consumers. Uh, you know, a lot of Canadians are already seeing it's more expensive to buy groceries, to go out to eat. Uh, and if you increase wages and labor costs, that just means higher prices for consumers as well. Uh, debt has always been a big concern of yours, yours as long as I've known you. Uh, uh, is it still a concern despite low interest rates? Yeah, look, it, it's really a question of how lucky do you feel in terms of risk? It, it's entirely possible uh, that interest rates stay low for a decade. And in that case, we don't have a serious crisis on our hands. I certainly concede that. The question is, we don't always know when uh, when interest rates are going to rise. They're usually usually inversely correlated with inflation. And as some people have may have seen in the news, there have been some signs that inflation may be rising. Um, you know, some people argue that's temporary. But if inflation does take off, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the central bank to raise interest rates. And then that, of course, is going to lead to bigger problems fiscally. So I, I view it more as uh, what's your risk tolerance? If you're worried at all that inflation will increase and in interest or uh, interest rates will go up, we need to get a handle on debt. If you're feeling very confident that won't happen, then debt's not as big of a problem. Aaron, I want to thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Aaron Woodrick is the Director of Domestic Policy at the McDonald laurier Institute. Our unpublished.vote question asks you, what should be the top priority of the new federal government? Economic recovery, climate change, indigenous reconciliation, or electoral reform? You can log on and vote right now at unpublished.vote. I want to thank our guest today on the Unpublished Cafe, Katrina Miller of the Broadband Institute, Charles Bird of Earns Cliff Strategy, and Aaron Woodrick of the McDonald Laurier Institute. And I want to thank you for watching the Unpublished Cafe. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.